All right, welcome everybody to another episode of Tennis Channel Insight. And as always on the Tennis Channel Podcast Network, Mitch Michaels from the Santa Monica Studios, ready to recap Roland Garros 2024 with one of the friends of the show. We love having him on. You know him as a top five tennis player with 15 ATP titles, also an established broadcaster now. Uh, but just calling the action Roland Garros for five live sport with the BBC, the tremendous coverage there. Greg Gruzetsky, welcome back to the program, Greg. It's always good to have you on Tennis Channel Insight and a lot to talk about. It's a very interesting time in tennis, and we've got to crown some champions. Thanks for coming back. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was an unbelievable French Open this year. Uh, a lot of storylines. Yeah, there certainly was. And I guess we can kind of start there, and it's more of an open-ended question because you had your you know, pulse on the ground. And if you start with what the lasting image of Roland Garros was, and I know we have one dominant champion on the women's side, we have a new champion on the men's side, two Hall of Fame great players. But what was your lasting image? of the fortnight in Paris? Well, I think I had a few lasting images. I think, welcome back, Naomi Osaka. I mean, to me, that was the match in the women's event was Osaka versus Shiontek. Shiontek having to save a match point and then really cruising from there on in and showing us her dominance. I, I think she can win as many as 10 French Open titles. Obviously, Chrissy Everett's got the record at seven. She had a few <laughs> years away from the game because she was playing uh, other events. But uh, she looks the dominant force in the women's game, the uh, women's equivalent to Rafael Nadal, as I've described her. That's how good she was after that Osaka match. And then the men's side, I mean, Alcaraz winning the title, injured, not playing his best tennis, and finding a way to get it done. And the one thing that really bothered me a little bit, if I was going to be frank, was that, you know, that call in the fifth set for Zverev, the chair umpire came down. I was there live doing radio for BBC Radio 5 Live, and it's the first time we didn't get a replay. When they don't oh. show us a replay, that means the chair umpires usually got it wrong. Come on, guys, let's put the technology in, and at least if you're going to use the technology for the broadcasters, at least show us that the chair umpire got the call wrong, but they didn't do it this time. But uh, those were some of the memories for me, and just also Alcaraz, he's won on all three surfaces, now youngest to ever do that. Um, and for me, the impressive part was he wasn't playing his best tennis and still won a major. That last part is jarring because how good is it going to be when he is playing his best tennis? And, and just on the replay side of things, and, and I'm with you, that call was brutal. Still want to say Alcaraz probably wins that match. It does change the trajectory. It's not as easy as you know. It's just saying, well, what happened after? Uh, the overrule and the lack of a replay, luckily for us and for the players especially, this is the last year that this is going to be that way. The Hawkeye is coming be here. Uh, but for the winner of the match itself, Carlos Alcaraz, as you mentioned it, it was three, now three majors, three different surfaces, age 21, not playing his best, Greg, but doing something that hadn't been done since Rod Laver, winning back-to-back five-set Roland Garros matches in the semis and finals. He just found a way, and more than anything, what stood out to me, Greg, was the fact that he can raise his level, he can turn the tide and stop the momentum when he isn't playing his best tennis, when a set gets away from him, when he quote-unquote chokes, He's able to hit the reset button at such a young age and figure it out. And that's what stood out to me, how he won really the semis and the finals in the same fashion, digging deep and turning the tide. Well, he did. And I I think the coaching rule as well into effect, let's not forget, he won his first U.S. Open when the coaching rule came into effect in five sets in the finals as well. He won his Wimbledon finals in five sets. And I think the relationship with Juan Carlos Ferreira allows him to reset. It'd be fascinating to see if you weren't allowed to have those conversations, whether it would be different. Maybe not. But I think that's something we have to talk about as well, because by having your coach and allowing the player to talk to the coach at any stage makes makes a huge difference. And, uh, you know, he's the new superstar. But also, let's look at this tournament overall and say to ourselves, okay, Sinner wasn't healthy, still made the semis. Djokovic was getting his form back before he tore his meniscus. So, you know, I can't wait for Novak to get healthy again because I know he's got a few more years left in him and he still wants to play more. Sinner, if he can get healthy for Wimbledon as well and is fully fit and gets the right preparation, it makes everything exciting in the men's game because we didn't even talk about it. World number one and Sinner, new world number one as well. So I think men's and women's tennis have a lot of interesting storylines. And getting back to the point you made about Alcaraz, yes, incredible performance, back-to-back five sets win since Rod Laver. Very, very impressive stuff for young men. And we need superstars and personalities. And the French crowd love him because 
He doesn't yeah. play percentage tennis sometimes and gets the job done. No, yeah, th that's true. I, I will say, and we talk about maturity in tennis and in athletics a lot. Alcaraz having the reputation deservedly so of being mature for his age. To me, what I think of immaturity, and it's funny the percentage tennis point I agree with, but you know, down break point in the fifth set after securing that break, he plays a serve and volley point, which is a very, very smart play for a player that is known to go for the highlight reel shot. So I see maturity in a lot of different ways. I also see the ability for him to kind of just neutralize what the best players are doing out there against him. And I think that's the part of his game. Zverev didn't play a bad match. I know he had dips in his game as well. But Alcaraz saw something. He was able to win a lot of those rallies, and he found weaknesses in his game, and he exploited it, which is what champions do. Well, it is. And it, it was really one of those matches that was a little roller coaster because if you look at the first set, he played great. You thought he's going to crunch him all of a sudden early on, and, you know, 40 love up on his opening service game, second set. You know, plays a tough game, gets broken, lose that set. 5-2 domination in the third set, and then falls apart five games in a row, loses that set. Momentum was very not playing well. And then all of a sudden, a lucky return, things flow, wins the fourth, and then pushes it home in the fifth. So for me, the sign of a great champion is how many times have we seen Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, win majors not playing their best tennis. Yeah. For me, that's the impressive thing. Yes, you talk about the variety. Lots of players were using a serve and volley this year because guys were standing so far back on the returns. Even Zverev was serving and volleying sometimes, using the drop shot and the angles as well. So players are having to be more creative. And, you know, he's the most complete player we've seen at 21 years of age in this sport. I'm, everybody says the same, whether it's me, McEnroe, Roddick. It doesn't matter who's saying it. We're, we're all in agreement. This kid is complete, and, uh, you know, he's coming along, and he, he's putting it all together again. And when Djokovic decides maybe in two, three years or whatever, however long he wants yeah. to play, the rivalry is going to be, in my opinion, Sinner and Alcaraz, that the one we're going to be watching in major finals for years to come. It certainly seems to be that way. Just to note, Alcaraz can win. If he wins one of the next three Australian Opens, he'll be the youngest to reach the calendar slam. So he's got time for that. Uh, you know, yeah. start, start lining. Hey. He does have time for it as well. And um, the thing that's that's interesting about that with, with uh, winning Australia, preparation leading into that one's always perfect. And I have, <laughs> I have a sneaking suspicion Novak's going to be at 100%. The defending champion's going to be at 100%. And I actually, you know, we haven't talked about it, but let's give a lot of credit to Sasha Zverev because he was dealing a lot of things on court and off court and still made the finals. He's a much better player. And, Let's not forget, you know, he lost in that U.S. Open Finals in 2020. Then after that, he had that terrible injury against Rafa two years ago. Well, I didn't think he was going to get anywhere near where he was as a player. Year after, gets the semis on basically one and a half feet. And now he gets the French Open Finals where he still had a shot, having played so many yeah. hours on court. So men's tennis is looking really, really interesting. Yes, I know we want to see the legends of 24, 22, and 20 slams. <laughs> But come on, enjoy the moment. Yeah, I want to enjoy the moment as well. And on this Verev point, it was a remarkable run given who he beat, starting with Nadal, having to lock in early. This is a guy now who's made four straight front Roland Garros semifinals. He's got two major finals, Greg. He's lost in the fifth set in both. So I want to ask you the question as someone that's been there. Is the scar tissue debate a real thing? Is there, you know, he's been so close, he's on the verge, but we hear it a lot. It's got to be draining when you get so close and still haven't gotten your first one it, it does but it also you can use it as a motivation i mean look what happened to dominic team after he won that u.s open he's never been the same player yes he had a wrist injury but he achieved the ultimate goal and was questioning what if mm -hmm. Zverev got back to work and then had a terrible injury against rafa and he still had the hunger got to the finals and it's getting over those demons the start of the match was pretty ugly let's be honest double fault double fault you can't start much worse than a major final but still went the distance and and, and who knows what would have happened if he would have you know uh not had that bad call i still think alcaraz would have found a way but he's knocking on the door and he's becoming a better player all the time and he's put a lot of problems and issues behind him as well so i think i think he might get there one day because his drive and determination is so much that yep. he will have another opportunity. For me, it wasn't scar tissue. I just didn't manage to get back. So that's my thing. When you have your opportunities, you got to take them when they arise. And if you don't, you don't ever know if you're going to get them back. 
Well, again, full marks to Carlos Alcaraz, who wins his first Roland Garros title, three on the major count. Also, maybe, I mean, when he was, Greg, complaining about the court condition, maybe that's like everyone's saying, okay, maybe it is not playing like a clay court if Carlos Alcaraz is complaining. Well, the problem was is I've never seen it so dry. And Mm so on one section of the court with Novak was complaining, which caused his injury, you didn't have any clay. It was like a hard court. So... From my point of view, every time I've seen the finals at Roland Garros, they've usually topped up the soil with more clay and more water and made it heavier. This year, it was just bone dry in certain areas. And for players, that creates sometimes a mound. You saw the wind with the gusts and all the other things. And, you know, if you're getting those sorts of things happen out there, the players are so used to perfect conditions. In my generation, we wouldn't have moaned because Mm. we just dealt with it. That was part of the adjustments and the things you had to do was uh, find, find solutions. Look at the blue clay that Federer won in against Burditch. Bad grass, I loved it. Please don't have a good bounce, please, because that would suit my game. And now yeah. everybody expects grass, clay, and hard courts to be perfect. If there's a slight slant, slant on the court or there's a slight problem, the players yeah. like to complain. That blue, that blue clay brought up a lot of PTSD for some of the players. I think I remember a few of them at the top saying that they would never come back if they, if they didn't change <laughs> So, uh, but Federer winning that one. Well, yeah, it was uh, a remarkable Ron Garros, and you mentioned it too. Props again to Yannick Sinner, just the 29th man, first Italian to be the world number one. And uh, a tremendous achievement. It's, a, as you know, 365-day-a-year uh, achievement to get to that point, all the work he puts in. Also, his role in Garros, I mean, he lost to Carlos Alcaraz in five sets, not at full health. I think he takes a lot of positives, not just obviously for being number one, Greg, but for how he performed in Paris. Well, you know, we talk about great champions and guys who are number one and guys who become legends of our sport. What do they do when they're injured, they're hurt, not the perfect preparation? They still step up to the mark and make semis, finals, and win these events. And that's what Sinner showed us. I mean, he wasn't playing great and physically the preparation, problem with the hip, problem with the body, and still made the semis and still had a shot against Carlos as well. So for me, if he can get fit and get the right preparation for Wimbledon, I think that's what he's thinking. Okay, let's get this hip right. It's my time now to go deep at Wimbledon because he's pushed Djokovic on many occasions. I think if you look at it, it's probably going to be Alcaraz versus Sinner if both guys are healthy going into Wimbledon. That's got to be the finals. And it's kind of like a little bit of a passing of the guard if you can get those two youngsters in there because I think it's going to be really difficult for Novak to make it with that meniscus tear because I, I had surgery myself and I'm 50 and – I'm three and a half months down the road, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, not back to normal. And I had one in my 20s, and that took about six weeks to two months to be 110%. I think uh, as well, maybe the lesson here too, Greg, is that if you're that good, preparation doesn't mean as much because Alcaraz didn't play too much and Sinner didn't, and it's still, like you said, these all-time great champions, even if they're not informed, they just find a way to get through the draw. Yeah, but the thing you talk about preparation, and they're probably working harder than they're ever working to make it for that because you're not looking at the aspect of physio um, the physical trainers they're doing so they're not hitting the tennis balls so the ideal Mm -hmm. preparation is you want to get the balance between fitness physio and tennis balls they're doing more physio and more gym Mm -hmm. rather than getting enough time and reps on the court and that is the issue because they're not being able to do their ideal preparation and, and it's getting that balance so the work is no question there and the preparation is probably more, but it's not enough tennis. That was the issue for them probably coming into it. Certainly appeared to be that way. Uh, the last thing on this before we go to the women's final, Greg, I've heard interviews where you've said in the future you expect this to be Sinner, Alcaraz in some order, and then Holger Runa is that third guy. Where are you at with where Holger is now and how he can get and maybe how far he is away from getting to that level of the top two? Well, I, I think they've separated themselves from the pack. You know, and, and Zverev this year has been much more consistent. I mean, Holger, I like him as a player, and I think, you know, he should be in the pack of the three, but probably the third in time. But the problem he has is we saw the whole thing in the beginning of the year. He started with Boris, then he had Severin Luti. Then he goes back to Patrick Mortoglu, and, you know, they, at least he's got some consistency. But it's just finding that balance. And he lost a tough match at the French to Zverev, and, You know, he's got to show us something at these majors, starting to get to semis and finals now. And that's the way he's going to get into the conversation. Until that starts happening, 
they've distanced themselves from the pack in the last year and a bit. It does feel that way, right? Like it's not even about game or weapons. It's just get the result. Like he's got to find a way to just figure out a way to get deep in tournaments and then we'll take you seriously. Well, I think he doesn't have the same tennis IQ as those guys. So I look at him as a tennis player and the ball strike is phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Physically very strong. But you look at him from a mental point of view, as you know, we talked about Alcaraz serving and volleying, you know, when to go big. Even sometimes he goes a little bit too big at times. With Holger, it's always big. There's not that little subtlety of variety in there sometimes of a serve and volley. I know with Becker, he's trying to work to block serve a little bit, you know, get the image a little bit more mature. So it's all those combinations. And I'm sure Patrick's going to work on those things, but it's still a work in progress. It's a top five player in the world, but we're talking about the very best on the planet. And that's what his ultimate goal is to try to be. And he's talked about it many a times. Laura Greg Rosetsky here on Tennis Channel Inside and Recap and Roland Garros 2024. It was Alcaraz on the men's side. It was Igas Fiantek yet again on the women's side. Third straight Roland Garros, fourth career major in Paris, fifth on the total. Uh, we talked about it at the top, Greg. After that Osaka match, saving a match point, finding a way, winning those games on the trot in the third set. It was all downhill. It was a full court blitz. And Jasmine Paolini, who fought like heck to make the final, was up a break. And then it was all the downhill <laughs> Iga train from there. It's that That's the lasting image I have of her. Not just, Greg, that her clay court game is just mastery. Everything she does is like a symphony out there. But what's Rafa-like to me is she finishes the set strong and then gets the early break in the in the second. It, it really does come in flashes. It's like a boxer that can't keep their hands up because the onslaught is just coming. Well, it is. And I, I think... You hit on the best match of the tournament was Osaka. Imagine if Osaka would have served the forehand side instead of the backhand side. You know, we might not be talking about Iga Shiontek right now. We'd be talking about the comeback story. You know, Osaka coming out of the wilderness for a few years, lifestyle change, having her first child, all these things. And that would have been the talking point. But Iga finds a way. How many times have we seen Rafa? Remember when he's down two sets to love against Isner in the first round, wins in five, and then goes on to win the title? Iga's the same. You put her back against the wall. She finds solutions. 2-1, as you said, in that opening set. We're thinking, okay, great, we're going to get a match. It's not going to be an absolute <laughs> annihilation out here. But then 100, uh, an hour and eight minutes later, it's done and dusted. I mean, from there on in, it was 10 games in a row. Absolute brilliant. I mean, how early she can take the ball, the movement she has on the clay, the way she slides into it. The only area I look at her game and I say, okay, you can improve on her transition game forward because – when she was brought in by Paulini, or unintentionally brought in, she looked really uncomfortable at the net. And if she's going to win at Wimbledon, and she's going to win in the Australian Open, and win again in the U.S. Open, that's the area with her serve she needs to get slightly better. On the clay courts, she can still get away with that because her movement is so good. But if I was tactically playing against her, I would, I'd be willing to try to bring her forward. That would be, that would be my thing. Because if you stay in long baseline rallies, on that surface, forget about it. You're second best. On the clay, it's just marveling. It is rough. Like, no one can touch her. I mean, Naomi almost did, obviously. But since then, it's some of the very best players in the world. She goes right through. It will be interesting to see. And I know the last time we talked about this, Coco Golf had won the U.S. Open. We talked about how it might be good for rivalry. Iga's had a lot to say about that since. Beat her in the semis again. Do you, do you see Iga's reign extending beyond just Roland Garros? Do you think she's going to you know, be in the mix or continue to win a lot of these other non-RG majors? Well, I think if you look at it, she's won four French Opens, one U.S. Open. For Coco, yeah. let's be honest, grass against Iga, she's licking her lips. She's thinking that's my time to start squaring up this rivalry because she really came to the forefront when she beat Venus Williams and, and announced herself to the world and to the, the British public at Wimbledon. And I think Brad Gilbert's done a great job with her. And I think they're probably saying, okay, semis is solid. We didn't play our mm-hmm. best in the semis, but now we got Wimbledon coming on. This is our one after winning the U.S. Open last year. So I think the rivalry will be there, but on clay, it's like watching Rafa. I mean, we got Federer, Djokovic, Murray, yeah. all, Vavrink, all those guys. I'm sorry. It's just that's what Shiontek is now. So I'm hoping, yeah. I'm hoping that Coco can bring her A game to Wimbledon this year and has got a real shot to win. And then 
Let's not forget Sabalenka got ill this year at the French. And there's a few other names as we're backing them, players like that on the grass court. So Wimbledon's wide open. And if you're talking about Wimbledon coming up, Shiantek is not one of the favorites for the title. No, no, uh, she wouldn't be. That's clearly her worst surface. I think some of these bigger hitters, especially Sabalenka, Rabakina, who have had, had success against Iga, have blueprints that could work. But we know what Iga brings to the table. Coco, I'm with you on the grass. Should be very, very well off. Remember a loss in that first round last year to Kennan, and since then went on a tear. So it's going to be it's going to be very fun to see. I uh, did want to shout out Jasmine Paolini up to number seven in the world. Yeah. What an improbable run from someone who had never gone past the second round at RG before. Second round of a major before this year started, and yet here she is, a top ten player. Oh, amazing story! It's 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 like a Cinderella story. I mean, you talk about this year, fourth round of the Australian Open, their best major. Not only does she get to the finals in singles, she gets to the finals in doubles. I mean, yeah. I mean, unfortunately for her, she ended up two-time running her up. But, I mean, yeah. a heck of a week. And you got to give a lot of credit to her coach as well, Renzo Furlan, Italian, who's as high as 21 in the world, who maximized his game. Her relationship has been great. She's talked about how he brought clarity, how she wants to play. Her movement's exceptional. She strikes the ball massive with that forehand, takes it early. But the problem she had when she came to the finals, she played the best. And every, everything she does really, really well, John Tech just does a little bit better. So an amazing, amazing result. What I've said at the start of the tournament, she'd be number seven in the world, top ten player, slam final, no. So well done to her. Enjoy the moment. Congratulations. What a fantastic run. Great personality, great character, and I hope she has some great results in the futures. What are, you, what are you seeing from Italy right now that's kind of separating themselves from the pack? Because this is more of just, you know, before it was center, and then you had some other guys and girls. But this has kind of become a real movement from Italian tennis. Well, they, they always seem to have a good history of uh, tennis players. Let's not forget Vinci Panetta who, won, Panetta, who won the U.S. Open. You also had Fonini. You had Berrettini finals of Wimbledon. You know, there's a generational thing. And then Sinner shows up and says, hey, look. I'm number one now. That's what I dreamed of. That's what I'm doing. I won the Australian Open. So everybody's pulling each other forward, and every generation is getting better and better in women's and men's tennis. So I don't know what's in the water in Italy, but could I have a drink, please? Because they're doing phenomenally well. And it's also a cultural thing. You know, it's about tennis clubs as well. They have a lot of tennis clubs, a lot of clay courts. It's a social sport. I think, you know, they did that so well in France. They do that so well in Italy. In every part of Italy, tennis is, is hugely popular. The two pop, most popular sports are obviously what they call football, which is soccer in America, and, and tennis. So, you know, it, it's just growing the game, and they have superstars to look up for. How fortunate are they with all the players they have? I mean, uh, it, it's great to see. It certainly is. They've done a tremendous job uh, growing the game domestically and now having the success globally. Uh, other lasting image before I forget from Roland Garros, Mira Andreva's arrival on the scene to the back end of majors. Didn't end well for her in the semifinal against Paolini, but the 17-year-old Russian now just starting her second go at all these Grand Slams. Seems like she's going to be in the mix for a while. Oh, she is. We've been talking about her the last two years. And, you know, you make your first semi. We all thought she was going to be in the finals, let's be honest. Most most pundits would have picked her to come through against Paolini. She didn't... Uh, she didn't get through, but at her young age of 17 to be in the semis and then getting onto the grass and the hard courts, there's no reason why she can't have deep runs in those other majors. And she's got the tools. It's just tactically being a little bit more astute, learning how to handle that pressure in those situations. And she's a fast learner with a big game. So her future is, is going to be very, very bright. Yeah, look, it's been a great, great Paris and, and clay court season in general, Greg. And now you switch over to the grass. I know this is, you know, where you had a lot of success, but also something you can comment on this transition. Not the easiest one, but, you know, something that a player has to do to adjust for such a short season. How did you and how different is it now, you know, attacking this transition? The transition is so much easier than it used to be. Because in my generation, I was only any good in the last century. So that was a heck of a long time ago. You had get <laughs> off the train from Paris if you wanted, like Rafa usually did every year. And if you decide to play a warm-up event, it was Queens right away. So nowadays, you've got a week in between. So you've got a three-week gap rather than a two-week gap, which makes a huge difference. So all those players that are in the second week in Paris get a week to either have an extra tournament or have a week of preparation and a few days off before they start up and can play one event, one week off, and then get ready for Wimbledon. 
Also, since 2000, as you know, they changed the grass dramatically, put it into rye grass. So it, I was hitting a few balls at Wimbledon, um, which I'm going to hit, uh, hit yesterday and I'm going to hit tomorrow. And it just bounced up to waist high, starting up right from the beginning. Also, on top of that, it, it, it's basically a millimeter longer, which most people don't think as much. It went from seven millimeters to eight. And it's just so much harder with that rye grass that the transition yeah. isn't as hard. And they're allowing players to practice, even on center court. So that, that means that it's not as slippery. So they're trying to make it so the transition isn't so difficult. In the old days, it was massively different, much more difficult transition. And nowadays, it feels like a medium, slow, hardcore, but that still takes the slider. And it depends on weather. If we get cold weather here in the UK, I'll play slow. If it's warm, it'll play faster. So there's so many different elements to deal with, but the transition is nowhere near <laughs> as difficult as it was in the past. Well, that's really good insight and intel into what these players are going through and how it's been easy, more accommodating the transition. Uh, just to follow up on that, though, with this being an Olympic year, does that impact how you know the, the, the year goes, scheduling stuff out, maybe even that transition? Well, I, I, think, I think being an Olympic year, if you don't have a good Wimbledon and – you think to yourself, okay, I've got one more shot at the Olympics. And I know a certain guy by the name of Novak Djokovic is uh, trying to target that Olympics. Let's hope he gets healthy and can possibly yeah. make it through there. And also, it only happens once every four years. And it's a t really tight turnaround for those that get to the semis or further at Wimbledon to try to get used to clay courts from the grass. So, you know, I think going from grass to clay is harder than going from clay to grass because you have to get used to sliding. Because on the yeah. on the grass courts, if they're say dry or not so wet, then you're not sticking as much. You'll see some people slide on it, but if it's uh, if it's if it's wet, they they stick more with the shoes and they're a little bit more cautious. So I think going clay to grass is easier than going from grass to clay. It's probably why Nadal mentioned like I don't know if I can go grass back to clay for the Olympics, given the adjustment. <laughs> Uh, now it's uh, that's really good uh, insight to kind of talk about, and as we gear up for this grass court season, you mentioned him. The last thing I wanted to bring up was Novak Djokovic. Doesn't look like Wimbledon's going to be in the cards. Trying to get back for the Olympics, he's won everything except the Olympic gold medal that there is to win. I'm not going to write him off, Greg, but at his age, you have an injury. It is no guarantee you come back. So, I guess the outlook for you for Novak Djokovic in the couple next couple of years would be what? No, I've I've. Um... I've had some conversations with his agent, and he wants to play a long, lot longer. Uh, he wants to be the Tom Brady of tennis. And a meniscus injury is not serious. It's just bad luck. And he was starting to play well at the French. I would not discount Novak. If Novak wants to play for another two, three, four years, whatever it is, don't write him off because this is not a serious injury. And he is the most disciplined athlete I've ever seen. I think he's probably the greatest athlete I've ever seen in my life. I mean, he is that good as a player. And yes, this year hasn't been great for him, but let's not forget, last year he won three of the four majors and he was in the finals of Wimbledon, probably one of the Wimbledon finals where you, he should have probably won the match, but things just didn't go his way. And everybody's writing him off because it's five months he hasn't played great and he's got an injury now. I'm not writing him off at all. I think he's going to be back with a vengeance. I think if the hunger's there and he still enjoys traveling and he can get the family on the road with them a little bit more. Watch out. Olympics yeah. is going to be tough. No question about it. But that's where the medical team yeah. is going to be having to do their magic. I mean, look at that Australian Open. He won with a stomach tear. How did he do that? I mean, just superhuman. And yeah. I know the driver for this year for Novak. If you say to Novak, oh, another major or three majors or Olympic gold, what's more important to you? Olympic gold is by far number one in this catalog. So I think he's going to try to give that all his efforts to be there. And if he has a shot and his team and his doctor and his people around him say, okay, we can manage this and you'll be at 85, 90%, I think he's going to risk it. Because he's going to have to wait another four years to achieve that, that dream of his to, to put Olympic gold around his neck. And if he doesn't get that sort of write-off from his team, I think he's smart enough to wait until New yeah. York for the U.S. Open. There's no real silver lining with an injury, especially a bad luck injury like a meniscus tear. But I will say that the one thing maybe we've wondered if he's going to have is motivation. And this might give it to him in a weird way. Like you said, coming back with a vengeance, people may be doubting him and the chance to 
prove people wrong and to continue his legacy. So I do think that, you know, this is a very competitive guy at his core, regardless of what he's won. He wants to go out and prove how good he is every single match. Well, the thing which was, was a shame was he was getting it back in, in, in Paris. You know, he'd, he'd made some changes in his team. He'd gone it alone. And, you know, those epic matches that he won early in the morning, you know, we saw that old fire back. I'm, when I watch Novak and he's quiet, I don't enjoy it. I have to see the passion. I have to see that little bit of, okay, anger out there. I like to see his box. He's a guy who likes that motivation coming to him. And I think, I think we haven't seen the last of Novak. I think, I think he's coming back and those youngsters are going to keep him motivated. Unless there's something where he wants to spend more time at home with family, which is understandable. But I think he wants to play a lot longer and I think he's great for the game. Well, Greg Rosetsky, this was fun. Always a blast having you on Tennis Channel Inside In. I did want to mention, uh, like, you can't do everything. Roger Federer giving an absolute banger <laughs> of a command to Dartmouth. 27 minutes, just, I mean, what's this guy? He's going to be a motivational speaker for the rest of his life now. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I did watch it, and, and uh, you know, it was a very impressive speech because yeah. he, was, he really correlated things well because everybody thought what Roger did was really easy. And most people didn't see those training sessions in Dubai. And I had a few British players who went down with him and trained with him in Dubai. And they were telling me he's doing six, seven hours a day. And he's putting in the work. And he put the laissez-faire there, as he said, when he'd come to the match courts and practice and people thought it was easy. And he was comparing it to people's students' grades, getting AIDS and so forth like that. But it's, you don't see what's going on in the background. And I think with everything he's achieved, he has immense talent but he had an immense work ethic. And I think he had a really, really good group of people around him and a very good family. And he had that drive and the desire to, to be the best and maximize him. So, uh, you know, impressive speech there as well. It's not even his uh, first language. So uh, I think he can yeah. give a few speeches and do whatever he wants to do. He's Roger Federer. Remarkable again, as always, for Roger Federer. Uh, Greg Rosetsky, always a blast having you on Tennis Channel Insight and can't wait to chat again. I know Sunday, I think it's Sunday, right? Big uh, Euro soccer game for uh, your native country of England. So you got that on the agenda? Yeah, this, this is actually the fun time of year because the Euro is always happening during Wimbledon. So usually this is like the early rounds. And then you get the tennis and you get the soccer, as you call it, in America. And, and our, our team is looking pretty good. We've got a good manager in Gareth Southgate and a good side. So this could be our years. Last time we Euros, we lost in the finals to Italy. So maybe maybe it's our turn. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. Greg Ruzetsky, he was uh, one heck of a player, one of the best in the world. He's doing the same in the broadcast industry. One of our favorite guests here on Tennis Channel Insight. And thanks for coming on. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me.